Hi. So there's a lot of stuff happening in the United States right now, and I just wanted to preface that this episode was recorded before the murder of George Floyd, and what Ian and Vivian share on this episode are really timeless pieces of advice and very much needed more than ever right now as we try to figure out how we can create more solidarity with our black community. And so with that, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Ian Alexander and Vivian No. Black Lives Matter. Hi everyone, my name is Stephen Wakabayashi and you're listening to Yellow Glitter, mindfulness through the eyes and soul of a gay Asian. Every episode, I share with you what's on my mind or things I'm struggling with and how I'm working through it to help you live a more mindful, fabulous life. This episode, we have some extra special guests, Ian Alexander and Vivian No. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Ian Alexander, he, him, is an actor best known for his role as Buck Vu in the Netflix sci-fi series, The OA. He'll be making his video game debut as Lev in the highly anticipated The Last of Us Part 2 for Naughty Dog. Ian is a passionate advocate for transgender and racial justice, and he hopes to see more representation of transgender youth in media. When he's not on set, Ian loves taking naps and walking his dog, Max. <laughs> it's true. It's I do. amazing. <laughs> and we also have Vivian No. Vivian She Her is most known for her role as Trin Fan on Ava DuVernay's Queen Sugar and roles on NCIS New Orleans, Shameless, and films that have played at Slam Dance, South by Southwest, Fantastic Fest, and Con. Other career highlights include being drowned on primetime TV, eating Nok Man on cable TV, and talking to an imaginary dagger on Shakespeare's globe. In her free time, she enjoys browsing the web for Vietnamese memes and dogs. <laughs> I love that Lucy actually used that bio. That was like my joke bio on the scene spark page. <laughs> <laughs> was it? <laughs> well, I love everything about that. I had to have two bios because I was an actor and then produ- on, then on, on crew with the production team. So like yeah. my, my producer bio was legit and then my actor bio was just like i didn't even say my credits <laughs> <laughs> so which one is this one the producer the actor she, she combined them oh ah, yeah amazing amazing yeah, amazing found on, on on primetime television that was ncs new orleans and then ah, the nook mum where the fish sauce was yep. on uh, queen sugar <laughs> amazing amazing yeah truly amazing well welcome vivian and ian so glad to have you both on the show and i just want to ask just how are you both doing but like really during this unprecedented time ian ah it's it's so good to be on the show i hope that any other like vietnamese trans trans masks that are listening to this feel really validated um i'm just quarantine is Mm. (laughs) it's a lot I'm just learning how to take care of myself I don't know like I'm a 19 year old I realized amidst this quarantine that I was just kind of like running ceaselessly like just kind of distracting myself like running around and quarantine has just allowed me to slow down and like have the privilege to have like all these distractions just kind of like stripped bare I don't know it, it, it's it's such a learning experience for me of like really learning what matters to me the most and like realizing that I really want to treat people in my life with like love and kindness because you never know what's gonna happen um so I guess I've just been like more grateful and things I've been doing to cope I I've been writing like a lot I've been journaling so much like just stuff for like myself and and for my partner who I've been recently living with because of quarantine. Mm. Um, so like we we write to each other a lot throughout the day and it's actually really sweet. We just like write each other letters, even though we're in the same house together. <laughs> we'll just amazing. like constantly write each other letters throughout the day. Um, and it's been a really great way of processing my feelings because I'm not really like one for 
verbal communication a lot of the time. Like I just have a hard time like keeping a cohesive mm. train of thought going. But writing has just been so helpful. Oh, that's amazing. What about you, Vivian? How have you been coping with during this time? I think it's been like this journey because like at the beginning it was awful I also isolated myself because I was sick so like I didn't like even leave my room for a while so it was like really rough I think also it kind of happened I don't know if you noticed the scene star campaign that we launched Mm -hmm. daughter was about two months ago so we launched like right in the midst of the stay-at-home orders kind of happening so this flurry of like the stress of prepping for that um, and then adding, which, you know, was already super stressful. There was already like, you know, I mean, we had a very ambitious goal. So for me, I was stressed out and then adding this layer of like, you know, I think when COVID started, there was so many questions of nobody understood what it was. We didn't know how long it was going to last. All that anxiety mixed in with the pressure of the campaign, which initially was going to be a 30 day thing instead of 60 day thing. So it was like hard and fast. So I had a hard time at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I've been talking about how the campaign for me was really stressful because it was a lot of work. But because yeah. I had to constantly, I think, engage with it and have something to work on unlike some other actors who are just kind of like out of work for me, because I had to be productive because there was like almost like this very high stakes thing of like, if we don't raise this money, we're not going to finish the film. So having the structure of that um, was really good. Um, But I haven't really been able to fully, you know, kind of, I think experience quarantine because I, the last few weeks, especially I've been so focused. So this week was like me starting to kind of, decompress and Mm. I've actually like Ian saying been saying like I feel like I've been having a little bit of time to really feel Mm. the stillness because like life in Los Angeles especially in the industry is just this constant like hustle especially when you know for me I'm like kind of entering mid-level career but I'm still at the beginning of it like I there's still so much of me having to hustle and you know, having to go to community events to just support and network. I don't really like using that word, but you know, like, <laughs> yeah. the of like, oh, somebody has this show right now. There's a screening for this. And I mean, I loved going, but it was really exhausting. Mm-hmm. Um, and then always, you know, the life of an actor is just so, you know, spontaneous. You're kind of always at the beck and call of other people. Like if you're not, wildly famous you're kind of yeah. at the behest of somebody else so mm-hmm. i realized that like oh i've just been i've been acting for like over 10 years now i've been in la for like six or seven years um so i finally i'm like oh i have time to just do whatever the fuck i want mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. nice um yeah so Are i we both in la yeah we both live in los angeles yeah nice mm-hmm. nice yeah i'm yeah, I'm in more of uh, East LA, like near Pasadena. Yeah. yeah. Nice. So I'm, yeah, I'm starting to enjoy it. I'm starting to know, I mean, I'm fortunate because I have unemployment. Uh, so like, yep. I know it's different for folks who are financially kind of in flux, but I think for me, it's that thing of like, when, for me, it's like that thing of like, well, there's nothing I can do in terms of getting a job. So <laughs> can't still think about it. Might yeah. as well just make the most of this time because there's nothing I yeah. can do about it. So. Mm. Yeah. And bravo for getting that Steven Spark campaign running and bravo for actually hitting your goal too, which was amazing. Thank you. Amazing job. Yeah. Yeah. It was a, it was a team effort. It was <laughs> it was so much hard work and I'm just so amazed um that, you know, each of member of our team really gave it their all and I'm just so proud of our collective effort. Yeah, yeah, I legitimately did not think it was going to happen like a week before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and so well, let's talk about Daughter, the film that you both had created um, in a little bit. But I want to first touch on kind of what we all share in common. So I did a little bit of stalking, cyber stalking of you both before <laughs> this. 
to do some research and it was just amazing to find out that we all share this thread immigrant parents and so i just wanted to ask you guys how was it growing up as a second generation immigrant here in america yeah i mean in my experience my I, I know my mother's childhood was very, very different from my father's. So I came from a biracial household. Uh, my mom is a Vietnamese immigrant and came over at the age of like nine years old. So she was very young, you know, actually lost both of her parents at a young age. So she had to like really, really persevere uh-huh. and fight, fight her way through, you know, years of poverty. And, you know, um, she worked her way through multiple, multiple jobs in college and just like studied the hardest she possibly could. Um, And she met my dad who is white American, was kind of like born and raised in Utah. Um, They both had like totally different backgrounds. Um, He's very religious and she was raised Buddhist and kind of didn't really have much religious affiliation. But I, I had very very different perspectives from my parents growing up um, Mm. because they just were such such different people with different backgrounds and I think that kind of just shaped me to be this person with a lot of duality and kind of like I feel like I've had a lot of different perspectives in my life like also being trans like I know what it was like to be raised female but also to like be seen as a male recently Um, so yeah there's a lot of duality to my identity there um, that was just my experience. Mm. And how was it navigating the trans identity in such a colorful household with so many different religions, spiritual practices, and backgrounds? I think, honestly, I don't think my parents really understand uh, my gender identity as much yeah. as I would like them to, even to this day. They just uh, they have a hard time understanding I don't know if it's, you know, generational thing or just, you know, both of their backgrounds. Um, but they are really supportive of me in other ways. I just, you know, I just don't think they understand mm, my gender and sexuality yeah. as much. Um, but I do believe that they, you know, they'll come around eventually. It was it was definitely hard uh, when I was a teenager just because, yeah. like, me and my parents had such opposing views. Like, I'm a very like progressive leftist like political yeah. person and I'm very passionate about like racial justice and mm-hmm. you know gender equality and all this stuff and my dad is a pretty like you know fiscally conservative person um mm-hmm. and you know since he just has like that perspective of yeah. a white man being raised in Utah um we would disagree on a lot mm-hmm. of things mm-hmm. um, but, but, you know, I, I still feel like we, at the end of the day, we have a lot of common ground um, about how much we, we, we do care for each other as a family. Yeah. Um, and my, my parents actually recently have been super, super supportive. They mm. were super happy that a uh, daughter reached our goal. And mm-hmm. my whole extended family were like, you know, sharing the link around and like posting it on their social Amazing. media. It's just like the cutest thing ever. Yeah. What about you, Vivian? How was it like with your experience growing up in Southern California, right? If I'm not yeah. mistaken. Um, I mean, I think mine is going to be wildly different from Ian. <laughs> um, not just what, I mean, not yeah. like so many layers of like, I think, you know, Ian is quite a bit younger. So his mom uh, kind of grew up here. Whereas for me, my parents, um, uh, came they they escaped and were refugees and my dad came when he was 21 and my mom came when she was like in her mid-20s uh and that definitely shaped a lot and I think for me too I so sorry backtrack so for anyone that's listening probably don't know about me um I am born and raised in Orange County spent 18 years of my life there and I don't know if whoever's listening knows this. Orange County is like the largest Vietnamese population outside of like the country itself. And I grew up like five, 10 minutes away from little Sa- Saigon, like like five, 10 minutes like outside the heart of it. So I was like kind of on the outskirts of little Saigon itself. So for me, that was like a very interesting experience because it's like, you know, I knew for minorities because of media, but you know, not when I, you know, was at home, like 
my mm. school, you know, I had, I went to a high school that had a very large graduating class, like about 800 kids, but so like so much of the population was Vietnamese or Asian. Wow. Yeah. And wow. like for me, I remember the joke for me was I'm Vivian Ngo. And I was thankful my last name was Ngo because there were a slew of v- Vivian Les and Vivian Wings. Um, and, and then Vivian Tran. <laughs> Specifically in my graduating class, there was like three girls that were named Vivian Tran. Wow. So, and I was the only one that had my last name. So, um, and there was just like, you know, in the yearbook, there's one page that's entirely just Wing. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Of, the, of just the senior yeah. This is not even, you know, like, um, yeah. So I, I had a wildly different experience than Ian. Wow. And sorry, yeah. Stephen, where are you? Where are you from? Yeah. So I'm actually really close by you guys. Originally from West Covina, actually. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Born and raised. Yeah. You, but I was in. It was like mostly Hispanic back when I grew up, though. Yeah. So Asians were pretty big minority it was mostly hispanics and whites when i grew gotcha. up there. so for me i grew up around a ton of asian kids um and like that i always say you know orange county it's conservative and it has its issues right yeah. but i am forever thankful that i grew up outside of my like right out right outside of my community so i could really, you know have that experience of being surrounded by people that yeah. understood, you know? Yeah, yeah. You no, know, I did, did spend half of my time at like an all white, like a very white high school. And yeah, yeah. especially when I was doing theater. But yeah. you know, like, I'm very thankful to, or just even like exp- being able to have access to the food. The food is so good. Know, so good. <laughs> I miss the food, Vivian. I want to yeah. go to Orange County and get Viet food so bad. The best. Okay, where would you recommend if someone were to go to Orange County and if they had to go to a restaurant specifically, where would you recommend? So unfortunately, like because I haven't really lived there for like 10 years, I don't know of like the newer restaurants, but in terms of like classic spots, Brodard, their Nam Nung Spring Rolls, which is like a pork patty. They have a new location now, which I love because it's like down the street from my parents. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's like a bigger um, restaurant than they had for decades, but it used to be like the old restaurant. People would line up for it for hours Uh, just to get the the, (laughs) the spring rolls itself to like to go. My uh, my favorite cuisine of regional cuisine from Vietnam is Hue cuisine, which is like from central Vietnam. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, I'm always on the lookout for good hue food. Um, uh, what so, is good hue? F- like, what is hue food? Um, have you ever had bong ba hue, which is like it's like the spicy beef noodle soup? Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's one of the most famous dishes from that area. It's hue. It's an interesting cuisine because it's central. It's super Vietnam. spicy. Yeah. Mm. But like, what's what I love about it is like it's very in terms of the types of food because. The Nguyen Dynasty, they, yeah. the imperial palaces were in Hue, but then there's also like rural countryside. So the cuisine is like partially these super refined dishes that were created yeah. to serve royalty, but then you've got some other really great dishes that were like, you know, poor man mm. food that, that rural, like the country folks ate. So you've got like just this really great mix of stuff. I feel like there's like a heavier yeah. use of spices. Not just heat, but just like spices in yeah. general. Yeah, I don't know why specifically <laughs> the cuisine is so distinct. It must have been a period where central Central Vietnam was kind of isolated from the rest of the country because the, the dialect is very different to the point that folks from other parts of the country don't mm, understand. It yeah, I think I think food is a really good kind of jumping off point to talk a little bit about kind of what was it like with having the Asian culture and your own definition of Asian pride, right? For me, food is really interesting because I grew up with my mom cooking me all these lunch boxes. <laughs> um, so I'm half Japanese and half Taiwanese and she's the Taiwanese side, um, but she can cook both. And she would always pack me these like really cute Japanese bento box Aww. lunches. Aww. So cute, but I hated it growing up. Because I was teased all the time. And I just, I, at one point, I remember I went to my mom and I was like, Mommy, I just want a Lunchables. <laughs> 
And she was just like absolutely crushed. She, she spent so long making all of it. And I just wanted to fit in so much because it was just not, it was not hip to be Asian, you know? And I was just wondering for you both, you know, have you ever struggled kind of with your Asian identity? And has there been a turning point for you where you've embraced your Asian identity more? I think for me, the the irony though, like, you know, how Mm -hmm. I just had that whole spiel about being thankful growing up in Orange County, like that, like, of course I was like ashamed of it. I think there was that layer too of like, when you're Viet, you're dealing with the shame of being Asian, but not only that, you're the the shame of being like the jungle Asian. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. And, you know, like even that thing of like, oh, if I wasn't, if I was Asian, like, why couldn't I have been like Japanese or something like that? Like, yeah, refined. So there's like so many layers to that. I definitely was one of those kids that loved the dolls that had the blonde hair and blue eyes because I wish I could be mm-hmm. white. Um, yeah. And I, at a very young age, I don't even remember the exchange, but like by the time I was like five years old in like preschool or kindergarten, I forced my mom to pack me American lunches. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then like, and even then, like my mom didn't make sandwiches the way that like the white moms did. And I've like thought they were gross too, you know? Yeah. So I definitely, and then also like Lunchables were a thing, but that was a treat. So much so that now yeah. when I eat Lunchables, <laughs> they kind of taste like plastic to me, but they're so nostalgic. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> Oh my god there was like one year in high school where like yeah. all i ate for lunch was lunchables and like i just can't <laughs> eat one for probably like 10 more years honestly uh, i know it's like so much plastic for like a little piece of cracker <laughs> I mean, it tastes so great i don't know why i love it um but yeah, yeah. It, it, for me even that shame like there was that thing of you remember going to college and being very much like I'm the Asian girl, but there was very much a lot of like internalized hate where it was yeah. almost kind of like, yeah, I'm Asian, so I'm going to say it because there's no way of getting around it, but I'm not really happy particularly that I'm Asian. Asian. Mm-hmm. There was also that layer of I don't look to some people full Asian, which is just shit because I just look very Southeast Asian. I just don't look mm-hmm. East Asian. Uh, but a lot of people growing up would tell me I look mixed. So I used to wear that as a badge of honor. Like, oh, yeah, I don't look that Asian, mm, which is just yeah, so yeah. many layers of, I don't know. And um, yeah. it did carry on in terms of the food for me. Like, I loved Asian food. But when I started in high school making, was it high school or college? Because I was, like, trying to eat healthier. So I never really learned how to make Asian food. So, like, in college, mm-hmm. I never really made Asian food for myself. Um, mm-hmm. And I never had a desire to. And until pretty much a year ago when I was like, all right, I'm going to start teaching myself how to, to make Asian food. And then yeah. quarantine, that's been actually a blessing quarantine is that I have all this time <laughs> to figure out how to make the dishes that yeah. I crave. Yeah. Chef Vivian. <laughs> Like, yeah. So like for, like, for me, it was that thing of like, I definitely had a whole thing of like being very ashamed of being Asian, despite like also understanding there was no way for me to ignore it because I was like, no one's yeah. going to fucking look at me and think I'm not Asian. <laughs> Sometimes people don't think I am, but they think I'm some yeah. kind of ethnic. Exotic, right? <laughs> yeah. But it, I think for me, because I went to school in Minnesota, so I mm-hmm. went to school in Minneapolis, which was ha- yeah. hilarious because so many people in the Midwest would be like, "Minnesota, Minneapolis is so diverse," and I'm like, "Yo, mm-hmm. I grew yeah. up like in SoCal. Y'all don't know what diversity is. Like, if anything, it was the difference was there was a black population there, and in Orange County, there's like no black folks at all. So in terms of that, like." there was culture shock of like not really being around my people, not really be having access to those safe spaces where I wasn't the only Asian person. So for me, I think going to school there, feeling like an odd man out because there was also that layer of, there were quite a few international like Asian students, but that's different from being Asian American. And you could just, a lot of times tell and so i felt yeah. like i stuck out like a th- sore thumb like people were like who is this girl she's not she's not a foreign exchange student like what's she doing here and then my best friends in school were all other like poc or like jewish kids or queer kids um in an arts program so i was you know really being challenged in terms of like 
liberal schools of thought. Um, I had a really great theater history teacher that made us like read stuff like by Franz Fanon, which was, I always talk about this, the idea of the, in, of the colonized intellectual. So I did have like, I, I was being challenged in a way that I, I wasn't in Orange County because Orange County is this like oasis of Asians. And then I was very fortunate because I grew up um, upper middle class. So for me, like I was just in this insular bubble and then finally going to school and just really being challenged in so many ways, being feeling like an odd man out. It really did kind of start my radicalization. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> And, and then I came back to LA and the first year I didn't really have a lot of Asian friends. And then finally my friend invited me to, um, this artist collective that was started by Bo Sia, AJ Raphael and Dante Bosco. If, if you know those mm -hmm. folks, um, mm -hmm. it no longer exists, but it, it used to be this like Asian American artist collective that met the eighth of every month. So it was called we on the eighth. Um, and they had all kinds of things. They had like town halls, Q and A's, yeah. um, open mics and whatnot. So my friend, like kind of after months of like, kind of like, you should come to this, you should come out to this. She finally, I finally got dragged out to one of the things and it was just this moment of like, I feel like I'm home <laughs> <laughs> being around uh -huh. like so many years growing up being around Asians and then leaving mm -hmm to go to Minnesota and then coming back to LA five years of not really being in predominantly Asian spaces. And then finally being back, it was like, Oh, this is so nice. Mm, that's amazing. Yeah. So that was kind of the start of it, but you know, of course I've become more political, more aware. And as that, that happened the last five, six years, I've definitely become more and more in touch with my heritage specifically. Like I'm very adamant about like saying I'm Southeast Asian yeah. Um, in Viet, just because I know that those experiences are very, very specific. Yeah, and unique. Yeah. What about you, Ian? How has it been kind of growing up, not just Asian, but half Asian, half white, and um, navigating your Asian identity? Yeah, so in my experience, I I definitely have had so much like white passing privilege throughout my life and just like mm. white like adjacency just because of the way that like I was raised. My yeah. family is just super like... I, I don't know if like whitewashed is the right term, but like, do, like, I guess whitewashed could be used to describe my family. <laughs> Ian, I just like to interject. You always say that you're, you, you're, you're white passing, but I have never thought that. So I don't know where you <laughs> keep going. Okay. Okay. That's the weird thing though, because like, thank you for your interjection. Cause that is like another perspective that I see for sure. Like there are some people like my friends, like Vivian, who are like, I literally like can't see you as not Vietnamese, but then there are people in my life who have like, genuinely believed that I was full white and they they are just so shocked when they find out that I'm that I'm half Asian or that even so my mom is sometimes I think especially from like white folks sorry yeah. this is such like a tangent but I had a friend <laughs> who was like very clearly like half Korean half white and like a kid that we worked with was like surprised that she was Asian and like apologized she's like oh you're Asian and it was just like and then like another girl told her like you look like Bjork and it was just like what <laughs> <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> yeah, no, people that's that's a that's the weird thing about going through life as like a biracial person and also like as a trans person is that I have that same thing with my gender identity as well. Like some people they clock like my jewelry or like the mm. the way that I'm dressed or something or like you know just something about like my voice ticks them off and then they're like oh this person is female and then they can't see me as anything other than female even if I correct them like it just gets really stuck in people's brains like I think the same thing happens with my racial identity as well like if someone mm. perceives me as like this white man <laughs> and then, then I'm like oh actually I'm Vietnamese they're like wait what I'm so confused like some people you know it's just everyone has a different perspective based on maybe where they grew up or like if they had any Asian friends in their life but yeah it's 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 weird navigating that kind of dual identity and how sometimes some people perceive me as something completely different than I am but yeah I, I mean throughout my life I haven't really faced any overt like anti-Asian um, racism I I've mm -hmm. just been really lucky and privileged to kind of grow up in areas that were like safe spaces like not be, not 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 in the sense that like I had a bunch of Vietnamese people around me, but I guess 
when I when I was growing up in Hawaii for the first six years of my life, there were a lot of other like Hapa kids, like half Asian, half, you know, whether they're half Japanese or half Vietnamese or half Korean, um, half Chinese. And so I did know a lot of biracial kids, at least for the first six years of my life. And then family moved to Japan. Uh, mm. So I was surrounded by more East Asian people than like people from my own like Vietnamese culture identity. So honestly, the only person that was like a strong Vietnamese influence in my life up until I met Vivian, honestly, uh, was my mom. Um, mm-hmm. And she would you know, cook Vietnamese food for us. Um, me and my family would like make food together. And we had like traditions, like we celebrate the new year and that together. And mm-hmm. we we would learn how to, you know, make new dishes with my mom. So we kind of kept a lot of traditions alive through food, even if mm-hmm. even if like the language didn't really stick because my parents tried to teach us, <laughs> uh, me and my brother when we were kids, but it didn't really stick just because we didn't really grow up around like strong, like Vietnamese community. But yeah, food was definitely a strong cultural center point for our family. And then I moved to LA when I was 17 and yeah. through Jess Vu, one of uh, the producers of Daughter and also dear friend of mine and Vivian, um, she introduced me to Vivian at a like queer Asian event. I was mm-hmm. also like fangirling. It was really <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought? Look at us. So like, I got there before Jess. It was it was like it was a queer Asian event. Um our friend C B Lee, yeah. um, if you're aware of her work, she's an author. She like organizes this this Gaijin like panel every year at the Lambda Lit Fest. Um mm-hmm. so Jess had invited in and then me, and then like Jess was like, oh, and she had told me ahead of time, oh, Ian Alexander's gonna be there. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I was like fresh to LA. I had only I had only been in LA for like a few months. I was like totally like confused driving around Chinatown, being like, where is this? Where where do I park? Like what what's oh, going it's a on? Nightmare. <laughs> and then I met Vivian. I got there earlier than like I got there early, which is rare because I'm like late to everything. I, I <laughs> yeah. run on CPT. Um, uh, Jess got there a little afterwards. So I remember like I was just wandering around. I saw Ian and I was like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> Wait, I didn't know that. I actually didn't know this. I saw you ahead of time and I texted Jess. I was like, oh my God, he's here. <laughs> That's so cute. Uh, I was just like wandering around, like taking like selfies in the museum because it was at like the Chinese American (laughs) Museum or something. Yes. Yeah, that was so that was such a that was such an awesome night. And I was so grateful to have that opportunity to to meet you and look at us now. Yeah. And so you really kind of like introduced me to to like Southern California, like San Gabriel Valley and like OC, like we would drive down together and eat, eat Vietnamese food together and just like. I would have such a nostalgic experience being like, oh yeah, like I remember this dish from like when I visited Vietnam that one time because I have visited a few times uh, with my parents and like it just, it's been such a great moment to like reconnect with my cultural roots and to get like more in touch with Vietnamese culture through food. Food is one of my love languages. So, you know. (laughs) If there's a sixth love language, right? It's food for me too. (laughs) And kind of just on the topic of being queer, what brings us all together is this queer identity we all share. And I'm just curious from both of your perspective, when did you you realize that you were different? I think uh, for me, I realized I was different sexuality wise first before like I started to question my gender just because I found like more resources for like being what I thought I, I thought I was gay at the time. So I was like, well, I like girls. And I, I didn't realize that you could like multiple genders at once. I just I just thought it was kind of like either or you have to pick one. Um, yeah. You're the told. Way You're was told very, by like, main media, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was raised like very binary, like very like, you know, men love women and like that's approved in the eyes of God. And, you know, you have to get married in the church and all that stuff. So when I came out, I was like, I guess I'm gay because I was kind of like the only – which I had for my for my identity and then I just started really obsessively researching like medical transitions of transmasculine mm-hmm. people and mm-hmm. just watching YouTube videos for like hours and hours and being like 
hmm, I wonder what I would look like with top surgery. I wonder what I would mm. look like if I, you know, like took testosterone and like, yeah. but I'm probably not a boy. Ha ha ha. You know, like I just, I kind of like suppressed it and pushed it down because it was a very scary thought. Um, but then I was able to see through, you know, just like online community. And then also like, I was very lucky to go to a high school that was pretty progressive near the DC area. And so it was like a pretty progressive area. There was a gender sexuality association at my school and I met Mm -hmm. like other queer people and other trans people. And it's like, Oh, okay. So, so I can be different and that's okay. (laughs) All right. Okay, cool, 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 cool. So then I, I started uh, trying different pronouns and kind of different labels for my sexuality because I was like, well, maybe I'm like bi, maybe I'm pansexual, I don't know. Yeah. And it's it, that was kind of just like the start of my journey of, of realizing that I was different and realizing that I was queer. And then also coming to the understanding that that was okay and that I didn't have to have all the answers. I didn't have to know everything right away. It's honestly still an ongoing journey that I'm still mm-hmm. figuring things out as I go. Mm. What about you, Vivian? When was the point in your life when you understood that you were different from most of the folks? Uh, it took a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I like, yeah. so... I didn't come out until I was 26. Yeah. So it was very, very recent that I came out. Mm-hmm. However, before I like came out, came, like I, it was like two months of like realizing it. And then I was like, fuck it. I'm just going to come out. Cause who cares? I'm in LA and I have a support yeah. network. But prior to me realizing my sexuality, which I kind of still like kind of, depending on the day, we'll say I'm bi or pansexual or just fluid. Prior to realizing that, I kind of just for the longest time always said like, oh yeah, I'm just, I'm straight, but I just like really appreciate the female form. (laughs) And would always like talk to like exes about how hot I found a girl. (laughs) That's Um, fine. Yeah, like when I realized that in like 2017, prior to like officially coming out, I kissed a girl for the first time and then like, went home the next morning and like the last 10 years of my life just flashed by and I was like everything makes sense now because I used (laughs) to have this thing where I'd have these friends like girlfriends that were like close friends or best friends Mm -hmm. of mine that I just like felt I I would think I would I was going crazy because I was so obsessed with them and I'd get jealous Mm -hmm. And whatnot. Like I had a slew of friends like in high school and in college where I just didn't understand why I was so obsessive over them. And then when I look back at it, I was like, oh, bitch, you were just in love with them. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) So I think I like I recognize those things like subconsciously, but I, I, I buried them down because for me, I grew up around a lot of like queer men. Um, like I, I, I danced as a kid and then I started figure skating when I was eight. So there was always like a gay man in my life. Um, (laughs) That's amazing. And and so, and like, I didn't really, but for me, I think there was like the layers of like not really being exposed to a lot of queer women. And then also the confusion of like, I don't understand like the navigating, liking multiple genders. Like if I like men so much, then let's just like, let's just, pick that and make it easy because then it just it's it I won't have to deal with figuring shit out I think Mm -hmm. was how Mm -hmm. my mind worked in the subconscious of it but apparently all the gays in college knew I was queer (laughs) until until they came out and they're like oh yeah we knew we knew It's like, isn't that how it always works, though? It's like, you know, all the all the queers gravitate towards each other. And then years down the line, we all come out and look back like, huh, I guess that makes sense why we were all (laughs) we were all friends. One thing I did realize, though, was my godmother, who like she became close to my mom when they were both running away from Vietnam. Um, Mm -hmm. And we became best friends through that and kind of was each other's like life support because my mom escaped on her own. She was completely by herself when she left. Um, so her and her best friend from that, she became my godmother, but they had a falling out when I was 12 and I didn't see her for years until my grandmother's funeral, like last year. And then it suddenly dawned on me at the funeral. I took one look at her and then I like looked at my cousin. I was like, yo, 
she's a total dyke, isn't she? <laughs> and my uh, cousin was like, yeah. duh, like, what the fuck? And, I, and it was just like kind of that thing of like, I had no yeah. idea as a kid, like somebody that was super close to me was most likely a queer woman. And like thinking back on it, I was like, I wish we had, like I had been able to be in touch mm-hmm. with her as I, during mm-hmm. my formative years. Although yeah. like when I look back at it though, like eight year old me, like I, I think I probably knew because like she had a best friend that she lived with, but nobody ever talked about like their relationship. But it was just kind of like <laughs> there was that part of me that probably kind of knew, but like it just wasn't really yeah. nobody really ever talked about that. So it was just like kind of like, oh yeah, her best friend that she lives with, but I don't know why they like are so close. <laughs> I had that moment with some members of my family as well, where I was like, oh, they're not just roommates. They're not just best (laughs) friends. Yeah. So on the topic of just like queer identities, I know, Ian, you had the opportunity, the amazing opportunity to play a trans character on the breakout TV show, The OA on Netflix. And I just wanted to kind of just talk a little bit about that. Just how was that? playing that character yeah I mean that character was the first time I ever really felt seen in the media like I had never seen any sort of trans teenager Mm -hmm. on like a show that I that I could think of except for you know maybe Elliot Fletcher on the Fosters but I I didn't really see like a young like uh, pre-tea like pre-transition you know uh, Vietnamese, cer- yeah, certainly not like an Asian trans guy at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so playing that role, I realized like as it was happening that it would be a big, meaningful character for a lot of people, and I was just so excited to have that opportunity. I still am so mm-hmm. grateful to just have that opportunity to be someone for people to look up to who are also trans and maybe they don't feel seen in the media. I know I certainly didn't when I was trying to come to terms with my gender identity. So it's yeah. been, yeah, it, it's been like really touching for people to reach out and say like, you helped yeah. me understand like my gender identity or you helped like a family member, like my mom understand, you know, me yeah. being trans. It just really warms my heart. Cause like I had no idea what I was doing when I went on that casting call an online casting call for for the OA like I I was sitting there thinking like oh this role is gonna you know like (laughs) break new boundaries in television for trans representation I was just like oh cool a movie role all right and I didn't I didn't even know what it was I didn't know it was for a Netflix show I didn't know you know I I really hope that at least my efforts will be recognized for the trans community as as you know just trying to have true authentic representation and trying to uplift people that aren't usually given a voice and that aren't usually seen in society. Um, so, so yeah, that was my, that was my experience of um, playing the role of Buck Vu. I'm just so glad it happened. <laughs> yeah. And I think the really interesting point was in season two, you played both Buck and Michelle Vu in these alternate realities where you were male in one and female in one what was it like in that role Uh, or and even just like what was it like playing a female character who was trans in another life it's just so meta (laughs) yeah i mean so actually i just want to clarify i think my personal interpretation and sort of the interpretation that i have been putting forward is that michelle is more of a pre-transition version of Buck rather than like uh, female version. Just because I do much. think that Buck is still Buck like in yeah. each timeline, just maybe not quite at that point in time. Because I know that personally, like I would not have come to the realization about my gender identity if I didn't have like access to the internet at a young mm-hmm. age. Because it was, mm-hmm. you know, I was probably like 13 when I was on YouTube searching those transition videos. So if I didn't have YouTube or, you know, like a computer or anything, I definitely wouldn't have found out. I still would have living be living my life as female, most likely. Um, so that was kind of my interpretation of that alternate universe or, you know, dimension is that um, Michelle has just not quite come to 
that part of their journey. And it was such an interesting feeling to kind of step back into like a past self. Because I was at that point in my life, like I did live that life of, you know, being female for like the first 13 or so years of my life. So putting on a wig and putting on, you know, clothes that I just don't normally wear, it felt so (laughs) surreal, but also like comfortable and familiar because femininity was always like a costume for me. So to play like a female character um, was actually like really like liberating it almost like it was like I was reclaiming something I was like oh I've come so far in terms of like my dysphoria and just in my personal experience like I really like doing drag so I love dressing up and like exploring my femininity in that way and having it be like a costume that at the end of the day I take it off and I'm still Ian and I'm still you know masculine and a boy but I love playing around with wigs and makeup and being like fabulous sometimes. So um, I was just really grateful to have that opportunity to just show off a different facet of like my gender expression. And also that Zal um, and Britt, the creators of the show, they they checked in with me first before they even wrote it. Like they called me up mm-hmm. months before I got, got the scripts for, for season two or for part mm-hmm. two. And Mm -hmm. they made sure that I was okay with the idea that they were like, we just want to make sure that like, you know, you feel comfortable with this because we don't want to, you know, make you feel uncomfortable in any way. And I was like, you know, thank you for for this, you know, because it's very thoughtful and considerate. And it it honestly would be like kind of jarring for for like a trans actor to be expected to play a a pre-transition version of a character but I was down for the idea because I was just like, I, I wanna, I wanna try it. <laughs> it sounds cool to me. Um, and at that point in my life, I wasn't on testosterone yet. I was still um, just kind of waiting until I could turn eighteen, until I could legally uh, take testosterone on my own without parental consent. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was like, if I have like this limited limited you know two-year time window until I turn 18 of like I could play a female passing role I might as well take it um because now I don't know if I could really put on a wig and uh pass as a teenage girl anymore um so it is really interesting now that like that part of my transition is like immortalized forever uh, on television speaking of being immortalized you were playing a character in The Last of Us on Part 2, the sequel of one of the most popular video games on PlayStation. What did that feel like, just being transformed into not just a character in TV now, but just into a video game character? So I am just so excited for The Last of Us Part 2 to come out. Um, I've been waiting for it for years. Um, This has been a project I've been working on since I was 16, and I'm 19 now, so I just really have, like, grown up on this game and, like, with this team. Um, so, yeah, the family at Naughty Dog is just so awesome, and I'm so grateful to have them in my life. Uh, and it was such a cool experience. I've never done a video game before. I've never done, like, voiceover or motion capture, which is when you wear, like, those... Um, like suits with the dots on them and like Mm -hmm. you're on the soundstage and like a bunch of different (laughs) cameras like record the dots on your face and like every little facial expression that you make um it's like super super high tech shit (laughs) and it's so much fun because it makes me feel like i'm like in the the matrix you know (laughs) or something and um it just really showed me a whole other side of acting It, it kind of took me back to when I used to do like theater as a kid, um, I was like really involved in theater as like a young child. And I sort of stopped pursuing that passion when I got to high school because I started screen acting. But I realized that like motion capture acting is kind of like theater in the sense that like you just have to use your imagination. It's even like more bare bones than theater because like there's no set, there's no there's no props really it's just all like digital constructions and then like tape on the floor or like certain like sandbags to like indicate where door frames are but everything else is like (laughs) in your imagination um so that was a really really cool experience and i really love doing voiceover as well because being in a booth and being able to do like 
a 500 different variations of a sound uh, <laughs> really like speaks to the perfectionist in me. <laughs> um, Cause I just love having like, you know, more opportunities. Cause I feel like sometimes with, with TV, it can feel so rushed. Like you get like two takes and they're like, all right, we're moving on. Come on. We got to go, go, go as quick as possible. And then sometimes I'm like, ah, I, I, I'm not quite at that point in my like acting abilities where I'm like super secure in my process yet. So sometimes I feel like I would like, like a little more flexibility and time to, to think about what it is that I'm doing. And I know that all of this will just come with time and like, I'll get more experienced the more I like rehearse and practice and train um, and take classes and stuff. But I just love the endless possibilities with voiceover because you can just really go at it for hours and hours. When is when is it coming out? Do you know the actual release date? The release date? No. Um, that's a good question because it got changed a few times. Mm. Let me just... Okay, so it'll be released on June 19th. 19th. Oh so my gosh, that's like next month. month. <laughs> amazing. Less than a month away. Amazing, amazing. And speaking of other big deals, Vivian... I saw a little bit of your work on Queen Sugar, and oh my gosh, that was amazing. And also, I think it was like an amazing moment for you to be able to really embrace your Vietnamese identity and your family's refugee story. And I just wanted to know a little bit more about how was it like playing that role and how has it impacted you? Oh, wow, that's a lot. First of all, I... (laughs) Thank you. I guess it's just like it's been a while, so I'm just I was like, oh yeah, that. You're immortalized. You both are immortalized in media. <laughs> There's so like so many layers of that show. Like, um, like I love Queen Sugar. Um, I didn't. I had been meaning to watch it, but I didn't really start watching it until the audition happened. Um, but once I started watching it, I mean, the show I think is so important. I really call it like a love letter to black families in the South. And so it was like amazing to be a part of a show that I find is like culturally significant in this time in terms of them telling that story and that like, you know, paying homage to that world and the families um, in New Orleans. But I guess for me, it was just like, you know, I auditioned for it. Then, like, I didn't even know that there was, like, a Vietnamese community in New Orleans. So, like, the discovery of that, being able to work on a show that was, that's associated with Ava DuVernay, who's one of my idols. Oh, my God. She is, like, pioneer. Yeah. (laughs) The crazy thing was, I remember, um, there's actually a really great story behind it. So, um our our friend Jess Vu, the, the one that introduced me and, and Ian, she, we call uh we call her like Asian Google or Asian Wikipedia. She always knows what's up, <laughs> like in the industry and beyond, and like yeah. especially like with media Asian representation. So my character was in season three, and I recurred as a love interest to uh, Kofi's character in season three. Mm-hmm. However, Trin was like actually initially written to be in season one. And they just couldn't find an actress. I don't know what happened. I had a good manager at the time, but I slipped through cracks. I didn't read for it. So they changed the character to be a different ethnicity because the girl they wanted, um, she just didn't work out because she was out of the country. But Jess knew about this character, character and I met her in 2016 or something right after they had yeah. started filming um, season one of Queen Sugar. And she's like, oh, did you read for Trin or that character? Because you would have been perfect for it. And then she would remind me consistently of this character, like once every six months and being like, oh, it's such a shame you didn't audition for it because you'd have been so good. And I it just got to like this running joke of me being like, yes, Jess, thanks for rubbing salt in the wound that I like missed a great <laughs> opportunity. Um, yeah. And then cut to the beginning of 2018, the first audition appointment that I ever gotten was uh, mm-hmm. for the show. And and the other crazy thing was six months prior to the beginning of 2018, just on myself, I like kind of was like, I put it in like my mental vision board of like, yo, I want to work with Ava someday. <laughs> but I thought that it was going to happen in like 10 years, you know? Yeah. Um, And so when 2018 rolls around my first audition appointment, I get an email saying I have an appointment for this. I was just like, I'm going to make it happen. 
this is a weird universe, like a sign. Power of manifestation. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I just kind of made, I don't know how it happened, how I did it, but I just kind of manifested it and it happened. And then I had my call back with Ava and mm. I don't know how I didn't lose my shit and didn't cry in the room because <laughs> I certainly cried yeah. afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. I went to the bathroom after my audition and like bawled. <laughs> oh, that is amazing. <laughs> Yeah. So like the show really, you know, was kind of my first little like, I don't, I I still haven't had my like true big break, but it was my first little like, my first big like career defining moment. It really has changed a lot for me. Um, And not only that, like I met a lot of incredible folks. Um, Elise Din, who plays mother in our movie, um, I, she played my mom on Queen Sugar. So there's so many things that I'm thankful for. Um, like, I will say I didn't, you know, like the character itself was just, you know, a love interest. She wasn't like anything crazy, like different than me to play or anything. She was like a nicer version of me because I am I can be kind of like mouthy. Um, <laughs> yeah. So like for me, it was like so many layers of just like what it meant to be a part of that project and then, you know, being able to play a Vietnamese American character that's from an, an area that I wasn't familiar with. And like, you know, getting to know New Orleans, like I've, I fucking love it there. It's amazing. Well, I, I think I think you touched on something that was really interesting in terms of just casting, right? And yeah, sorry, side note, I only really got that role because Ava was adamant that they cast somebody who is Viet. I know that during the audition process, I only had two auditions. I had a f- an initial one and a callback, but or I it was like six weeks in between that before the initial audition and the callback. And every and they told me within a few days of my first audition that they were like, like I was pinned as they call it, like yeah. meaning they yeah. were they wanted me on the sh- like the short list of people that they were going to be looking at. Um, and pretty much every week after that. They called my manager and was like, we just want to double check. She's Vietnamese, right? You're sure she's Vietnamese. Yeah. Um, and like one of those things where I um, I was ready to play this role, but I didn't have the credits for it. So like that's a testament to like that I think of like creating opportunities for people and really following through with giving the opportunities to folks because had they just been casting open Asian like ethnicity – I probably wouldn't have gotten in the door. Like they probably would just have looked at other girls with more credits. And it was just, they were really, really specific and really, really adamant about casting somebody ethnically specific that I was, I even had the chance to walk in the door. I'm really like thankful for that. And that's a testament to like Ava and what she stands for and what she does. So I think that's really amazing that she does that and so honorable because a lot of folks they just give up too in the process right Mm -hmm. they're like i'm writing this role i can't find anyone so let me just get another asian right worse yet sometimes they're not even asian but they kind of look asian (laughs) and so just like from both of your perspectives you know um what what does representation in media mean for you especially in the world of acting Sure. I mean, I, yeah, I can go first. I think representation in terms of like specifically like Asian trans people yeah. means to me just like seeing like, you know, more people like me in the media and having people that have that experience of, you know, whether whether it is that they are Vietnamese or they just have that Asian solidarity, um, Asian Pacific Islander solidarity. Um, we all have like, you know, common roots and, you know, things that we all are have in common and common goals as well for representation. Um, So I really have been like just inspired by the sense of community um, that I've been introduced to, especially through, through Jess Fu and through Vivian. And yeah, I guess representation is just about feeling a community and feeling like, you know, Mm -hmm. there are people that love and support you and that look like you and have a similar life experience. I don't know. Uh, Vivian, what are your thoughts? <laughs> yeah. Or it could even be like, um, you know, I'm just like riffing off here just because there's a lot of conversation around 
representation also in terms of when you're casting right especially in acting is it important to cast folks based on ethnicity or is that something that actors can act right it's this th- it's this conversation i think goes back and forth that do you cast specifically the identities with that or do you get the actors who have been doing acting for a long time to then just learn these identities as a part of their acting do you have any thoughts on that yeah i have a lot of thoughts on that <laughs> i think yeah. <laughs> i think it's one of those things of like and just i think like representation like i feel like it's such a loaded word now because it's like so trendy to talk about to the point that on my end i feel like a lot of people talk about like the buzzwords and on a very surface level and i i personally sometimes get tired of that because like i feel like a lot of people will want to be like representation for representation's sake and for me it's so much more of like okay representation so we can talk about issues it's like humanizing us, yes, and normalizing us is is absolutely important. But what also do we have to do? It's like giving representation for like the folks that are truly, really without a voice in the community, which I think is the reason why like, you know, Ian meant so much to like a lot of folks, like a trans masculine Asian character specifically. Like for me, no way in hell am I ever going to be cast to play Chinese or Korean. Like some people will mm, otherwise, but yeah. there's, there's, it's like, come on, like, yeah. <laughs> look at me but then also look at the hordes of like korean and asian actors out there of course it's gonna you know yeah. um yeah. i think it's really important specifically for stories of like of identities within the diaspora that like you know especially if it's like a thai character or a cambodian character like name name a cambod a famous cambodian or thai actor yeah. like like there's some of them maybe like in terms of Thai, there's what Brenda Song who's Thai and Hmong, but like that's like the one person. Yeah. <laughs> that, like, I feel like like there's not. I think like when there's a character of an identity where we just really don't see a lot of actors of that ethnicity, it's like that's like that's a chance to give an opportunity to somebody who really doesn't have have the chance. Um, and again, like Ian, I don't mean to keep pointing to you, but like you are an example of that thing of like. Yes, certain roles, let's give it to the person who's been training and like hustling forever to to play that character. But nobody else would have been able to play Buck Vu in the same way that you did. And I don't think I would have wanted to see that. And the sensitivity and the rawness that you brought to the character, like I remember watching the show and I was like, oh yeah, that kid is really good. Like he's got a long way to go, but he's got, he's really, really good. And had you been not given that, opportunity to be in the OA, you probably wouldn't be pursuing acting because you pr- you probably just wouldn't think that that was a possibility. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So like, it's that thing of like giving opportunity for for very specific characters when it's just like, yo, this is a chance to give somebody mm-hmm. an opportunity, they can grow from it. Um, there are certain roles sometimes where I'll see it and I'm like, you should not be giving this to a newcomer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because sometimes like those ones are just like, that in order to be able to get that character right, most likely they will have had to like had a lot of training and experience mm-hmm. to be able to do that. Not saying that like Ian is less lesser than somebody who's more experienced. It's just it's it's so nuanced. And I think that's the reason why I personally like I don't know about you, Ian or Steven. Um, I personally sometimes get really tired and exhausted from conversations of representation because I feel like it's a very nuanced and deep conversation to have and I feel like so much of the time we are hearing sound bites and I'm like I feel like I've heard the same sound bite over and over and over again um which is why I'm kind of glad for this conversation because I feel like we're being able to have the luxury and time to really delve into the topic yeah, yeah. I mean there are so many different sides and perspectives to to this conversation like you said Vivian it's such a nuanced thing like my experience as like a biracial you know half white half Vietnamese transgender teen that grew up kind of in in different areas all over the world is completely different from someone you know who also might be like half Asian half white and you know maybe they grew up in an area where they they had you know just like all white people like their whole life um so you know we all have like vastly different experiences and different resources that we can bring to the table 
and you know we all have something to contribute to the conversation which is what i really like about like the online community of you know queer asian folks is that we can all just like connect (laughs) and you know from different parts of the world and and provide our different experiences and like realize that we do have things in common and support each other in that way i i love kind of just all the things that you're hitting on it's such a nuanced conversation but it i think it's important to talk about these deeper complexities right what does representation mean you know and i think for many folks they think it's a number right hit this certain quota so that we can put it on the news and the media and i think what you guys just mentioned and just in terms of just thinking about one the impact to you know what do you what do you want to achieve right with the role i think that adds so much more life to more than just getting the numbers up in a certain movie or film or video game and I think I think this is a really good segue into your projects that you're working on together, which is the movie called Daughter. And I don't I I'm probably gonna butcher the introduction of it. So would either of you like to talk a little bit about the project and kind of just like a brief synopsis and just um what are your roles on the project? Uh Unless Ian, you want to do it, I can uh, talk about it. I think Vivian, you're totally well prepared <laughs> to give the spiel if you would like to. Dog <laughs> <laughs> um, is a psychological drama that is about a young woman who is inducted into a bizarre new family. That's kind of I th- I, I might have butchered a couple words, but I I know Corey has had a very very specific verbiage that he wants. Um, when we talk about the synopsis, and I think that's like the official one. But, uh, long and short, it's it's kind of parable that kind of came into existence after Corey ro- uh, read Ethics of Ambiguity by Simone de Beauvoir, and he wanted to explore like what does freedom mean in an oppressed society. So he created this family that was like kind of a parable for different uh, types, subsets of people that live in oppressed societies. Uh, yeah, it's about this weird little family that kidnaps my character and brings her in, forces her to live as their daughter while they are self-isolating from the world because they are scared of an unknown toxin. And might I, I add that Corey wrote this script about a year ago um, and we filmed it like months before the first case of COVID was recorded. So that's the crazy thing is watching this whole world unfold and our world, the world of our film is coming true. Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely terrifying to think that Corey has like some crazy psychic ability <laughs> because he wrote about, you know, us being members of this family that never leaves the house because they're afraid of getting sick. And like the only times they leave the house, they're wearing like full like gas masks and hazmat yeah. suits. And now that's kind of like not too far from where we're at (laughs) with like quarantine um, and the stay at home order. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's really spooky. And then the special thing about this film, um, kind of going back to our previous conversation about representation, um, what's special about it is it's this little weird, like surreal art house movie that's kind of in the vein of a, a weird Europe, like a little European art film, or an even Corey has said, like, as we've been cutting it together, he's, he's saying that it's reminiscent of certain Asian uh, films as well. It's this weird little art film that we tend to associate with like Europeans. Um, a good comp mm-hmm. that we've been using for the film is a uh, dog tooth by Yorgos Lanthimos. Mm-hmm. Um, it's one of his earlier films. He directed The Favorite, if uh, anybody is unfamiliar with, with his uh, mm-hmm. with his name, The Favorite and The Lobster, if you've seen those movies. Mm-hmm. And what was special was it centers predominantly Vietnamese American cast were the family. Mm-hmm. And the story was like, the, the script was tailored to our ethnicity, but it's not really kind of the centerpiece. So it was really wonderful for me and Ian to play these to really explore a world that we often kind of only associate like white actors getting for. Um, and then we shot on film on a camera that's older than Ian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> me, the camera might be older than me. I don't remember. I think it's like a camera from like the late eighties. Wow. And I was just looking at kind of some of the descriptions of this project and what really impressed me 
was a diversity and not just the cast, but also the crew. I'm I'm looking at the stats right now. You had eight, so you had about eighty percent of your crew were people of color, and about sixty percent of the women during the photography phase. And how, so, my question to you, especially with my background, kind of uh, backtrack into what I used to do. So, I used to work in tech. I mean, I still work in tech, but as a part of tech, you know, like you mentioned, representation is such a hot buzzword, right? Especially in the past few years, and I think one of the big things as it was getting bigger and bigger where many of these tech companies just didn't have minorities that they hired, right? Most of their folks were white men. And so as a part of it, many of these tech companies have these initiatives to hire a lot of minority folks, women, people of color, folks with disabilities. And I think one of the difficult things for them, and they get kind of exhausted and tired, is we can't find these folks. We, we, we can't find the folks that we want to up our numbers so let's just give up let's just say we tried it and call it a day and what i'm just really impressed by is just how you were able to get so many folks the 80 percent and i just wanted to kind of dig into that a little bit into just how did you achieve that and do you have any tips for folks who also want to hire more people of color in their cast and crew? So basically, um, I do want to be 100%. We, we are saying 80% POC dur- uh, during principal photography. So we did have quite mm. a few other white folks eventually on our pickup day and yeah. whatnot. But overall, like we had a running joke on set that like the white men were like definitely the minority. The irony was we didn't really try to make it happen. We decided to hire folks that were very much like us, like mid-level, but looking for that, like really hungry for like a super intense art film that would really stretch us in a way. So like, and giving chances to people that hadn't had a chance to maybe play a leadership role or whatnot. Um, And it just kind of happened to be a lot of like Asian folks. We We can unpack that and say, why are they all happen to be Asian folks that are not maybe getting chances that they deserve. Um, Or we, I think that plays a a part in it. Um, But the whole thing of like, when people are like, how did you do that? It's like, yo, we just kind of, that's our network. I think that's the issue with a lot of times, like the more and more I think about it, a lot of the people complaining how they can't diversify. It's like, and, and that this is what I always go back to that thing of like, how are people going to expect to work together if they're not socializing together? True. <laughs> and I think of like when people are like, you know, like, why are the community, our communities at odds? Like the minority communities, I feel like one of the major issues, which I, like for me, I, I, I've been saying for years now, I'm less interested actually than in being playing a leadership role in the Asian community, I really want to be a part of what I think millennials and Gen Z, like what the next thing is, is like really creating bridges between the minority, different minority communities. Cause I feel like everybody, it's so disjointed. It's so much more segregated than any, everyone wants to kind of admit. Um, and then, and and it goes to the hiring thing. It's like people hire who they know. They hire who they can trust. And the thing that I've learned, especially as a producer, is like, yeah, I'm going to be in the future, like hiring people in my network because I've learned a big, like a lot on this film of like, I'm not going to just trust anybody with my, my little artistic baby. I need to be, I need to hire people that are vetted in terms mm-hmm. of people recommended with, from a by other people I trust in the industry or people I've worked with in the past or people that I'm friends with that I know are hard workers and will get the job done. And so that thing of like, when people are like, how do you do it? It's like, well, who the hell are you hanging out with? Who's your network? And I think for me, and in terms of how me and the producing team hired, like a lot of us are just folks that are really deeply entrenched in our communities. Um, so that's why when we, it came time to hire, it just kind of came to be that a lot of the people were people of color, um, and specifically Asian Americans. That's just kind of a testament to what our networks are. And then the same thing happened when we crowdfunded too. The people that came out the most were the API community. So, I mean, I don't know in terms of when people 
I guess your question is like, how, what's your advice for that? It's like, well, then look at who you're hanging out with, who your network is, who you're socializing with. Yeah. I with, think that's actually really great advice. Yeah. And I mean, I, it might be harsh for people to recognize because I, and that's for me, my biggest thing when I meet people that are like, well, I'm very liberal, like a white person that's like, I'm liberal. I'm like, yeah, but how many folks of color are you friends with? Mm hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. or or look different from you right yeah or like you know my biggest thing was when i first came out i had a coworker um who was a queer chick who took me out to a couple lesbian parties but like i stopped going because they were just like really white lesbian spaces <laughs> um and like you know that whole thing of like i feel like especially in the queer community is that like a lot of queer folks that are white will be like well i get it because i'm queer and but then they have no, they have barely any folks of color that are their friends. And then that, that will happen in terms of, I feel like in hiring, like if you're not really kind of putting your foot out there to like build bridges with communities that aren't your own, like, of course, you're not going to be able to diversify. Mm. What about you, Ian? If I wanted to hire more folks like you, what, what would be your advice if you were to help other folks to find people like you in in my experience i mean kind of similarly like with what vivian was saying like there are people you know within our communities that just haven't had the opportunity to have these jobs yet and they're out there waiting they just <laughs> they just need to be found um and it's just a matter of reaching out to people within the community honestly um and so that's what they did uh the casting, you know, director and Brit and Zal uh, for the OA, they, you know, they posted an online open casting call because they're like, well, we can't find anyone in our network that is Asian American and trans and like 14 to 15 years old. So let's just open it up to the internet because the internet has, you know, thousands of people <laughs> that, you know, could fit this criteria. So, um, you know, they found an online community that responded really well, you know, people were sharing it around and different like trans uh, online groups and, and the post went viral on Tumblr and that's how I saw it. Um, I know like Laverne Cox also tweeted about it. So a lot of like trans actors and people who are really like strong trans advocates were sharing the, the casting call. So it's just a matter of like amplifying those job searches within that community that you're trying to find. If, you know, if you don't know any trans people and you, you really want to hire a trans person, um, get to know a trans person. Like Vivian said, like find a group and socialize with them because, you know, we're out here. There's tons of uh, cohorts in Hollywood of like trans masculine actors and, you know, trans women in entertainment as well. So we're waiting to be hired. I will say a quick note, though, be respectful of those spaces if they're not your own. Mm -hmm. but you know, this is the queer Asian podcast. I'm pretty sure the folks yeah. listening to this are going to be aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But yeah. it's good to put it out there, you know? Yeah. There definitely is a respectful way of, of reaching out to people without like colonizing a safe space <laughs> for sure. Or like, I guess like in terms of like, if you're looking for a specific talent, especially like on camera talent and it is not your community, like, it's your job to go find the people that are going to be the experts on that. Yeah, for sure. There's a ton. Uh, actually, I have like a, a recommendation for anyone that is listening that would like resources of a place to go to if you have any questions regarding, um, you know, accessibility for trans people within the casting process during production um, you know, both in front of the camera and behind the camera. Glad is like a really great resource. Um, they have people where their job is literally to be allies for LGBT people and, you know, talk to casting directors and talk to directors and everyone involved so that so that trans people and queer people on set feel safe and, mm -hmm. you know, are being treated properly. So, um, so yeah, reach out to GLAAD. Shout out GLAAD. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so one more thing that I also read that I kind of want to touch on is just how you were making the project also really more equitable too. And I know one of the other producers, Lacey, had mentioned that you guys had included 
pronouns on call sheets. And I just, I think about this all the time in terms of my work too, and if I'm joining meetings and how, even on Zoom now, I'm starting to see people put in pronouns, it's in email signatures, and I think in terms of creating an equitable environment, what what was kind of in your minds and just how you instituted some of these things and why is it important to make it equitable? I I mean this I'm assuming this is going to be something I answer Ian. Um if you want to I could I could I could pitch in for sure but I think Vivian you might have the best insight about this. Yeah. Um well cuz being a producer on it um I knew going into the project that I did want to you know I I think people do the whole like walking like talking the talk but they need to fucking walk the walk type of thing. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and so early on, I was very, but I had me and Corey had a lot of conversations who Corey um, is a cisgender straight male, but he is a very good ally and quite um, respectful and really, you know, wants to do his due diligence in terms of being as inclusive and sensitive to things. But the two of us did have a lot of qu- um, conversations leading up to the hiring of like, we want to really, you know, prioritize in terms of making you Ian feel comfortable and then also just you know not even just that it what it's not just about making Ian feel comfortable it's just like doing what's right um so early on in the process we had I had said like you know without a doubt there's going to be pronouns because I'm like it's not fucking hard to do it's so <laughs> easy I don't know why people make it a huge deal like I'm you not like it takes 15 minutes it's, and I think it's one of those things where like I'm not gonna lie and say that like for me, being something cis, like it was, it it took me a while to learn how to ask uh, to um to like it took me. It wasn't until last year that I put I signed my emails with pronouns. I still have a hard time when I meet people asking them their pronouns because it is something that is still like something that I'm I'm still rewiring. But it's like that thing of like always like, okay, like, yeah, we're not going to be 100% perfect all the time, but you can always try to do better. And like for me, I felt like having the pronouns is just bare minimum. And it's something that I want to do in the future, regardless if I know if there's a trans person on set or not. Um, I mean, there have been other talks like we were actually trying to get a trans makeup artist because we knew that that person would be working closely with me. And it didn't work out because the one person I, got in touch with like it just I scheduling didn't work out or something um but like I think it was just that thing of like it was bare minimum like no like no matter what we have to have pronouns at one point I remember when I started realizing that a lot of the folks we were hiring were Asian I was like we need some we need other POC on this um and you know and then thankfully we wound up like hiring quite a few like queer folks not enough for us to confidently say like they were like a quarter of the set but like I know like on our our principal photography days at any given time like out of a set of like 20 something people there were always like four or five of us that were queer but yeah again like I don't know it's one of those things that every it's been a talking point a lot as we've been talking about this film having the pronouns and I want to like acknowledge it and I guess celebrate it. Cause I know that Ian, for you, this is the first time that anybody's done that. Yeah. So yeah. don't make it a huge deal and like pat ourselves in the back too much for it because it w- really wasn't a huge effort or a huge endeavor. It was very simple. I was the one who edited that the call sheet because the person handling the call sheet just didn't really understand what I meant. And so I was like, Here, just send me the file. I'll do it. It didn't take me that long. And I don't know. I just feel like if we just, if we make a huge deal about it, then other people might just like think, think like, oh, it's that thing that like you do if you go above and beyond. And I'm like, we didn't really go above and beyond. We just literally did the bare minimum. (laughs) It is like the bare minimum to respect people's pronouns for sure. And I I hope that it becomes more normalized and that, you know, in five years, it, it won't be something that's groundbreaking or new. It'll just be like a given on any set. Everyone knows on the call sheet, there's pronouns. Maybe even people have like, you know, on their, on their walkies, they have their pronouns. Like I would love to see that. It would be so great. And I also just wanted to like uh, talk on what Vivian said about hiring a trans makeup artist, because, you know, I remember she said, 
she had noticed that like I had mentioned in most of the projects I worked on, I'm usually like the only trans person on set. And so she was like, I just really want to make sure that like, you're not the only like queer person on set besides me. Um, So it, it felt really validating to have, you know, a true ally in that sense of someone that really truly did have my back throughout production of, you know, making sure that my gender identity and sexuality was validated um, and that I was like tokenized for my identity. I I hope one day in the future, hope so soon, right? It just becomes so commonplace. It's just like, what's your name? But it's just like, who are you? Hi, my name is Steven. He, him. It just like slides off the tongue. And I think yeah. as we're making the transition, you know, I, I'm just really grateful for folks like you guys um, to just set the stage for that and set the precedence for this because it's one, helping to teach and educate all the other folks who are on set, right, with this new practice. And I think, two, it really allows us to understand privilege, right? What does that mean? And the reason why I say privilege is because for a lot of us, we don't say our pronouns because we assume folks know, right? If I look like a man, use he, him, right? If I look like a woman, use she, her. And I think the biggest turning point for me with pronouns was just to give privilege, you have to give up your privilege. Yeah. I I really like what you said about um, in order to give privilege you have to to give up some privilege because a lot of times people don't want to do these things like inclusion about pronouns because it's different and it's uncomfortable because it's like I've never done this before I've never you know asked someone for their pronouns before but the more you do it the more normalized it becomes and the easier it becomes and like you said it'll get to a place of eventually everyone's just like hi my name is this these are my pronouns and it's not uncomfortable it's not awkward everyone just knows and then that way everyone can feel comfortable and included amazing one of the questions i had on my mind how did you both just like end up on this project together and (laughs) how did you decide to even like uh, go about doing this project yeah i've been i've been dating Corey for like two and a half years he just wrote the script for us (laughs) <laughs> it, it, it it has a really really sweet origin story though if if vivian if you want to dive into it or what do you I, mean? I'm not sure. just what? like well so so like cory uh joke one that the core well it's the real origin story but it's like really embarrassing or like the one about you at your birthday <laughs> wait what's the embarrassing one what <laughs> okay <laughs> Fine, I'll, t- I'll tell him before he can tell it. I'm going to tell him. So, yeah, this was like, yeah. was it like February or February of 2019? I got really drunk um, and I was trying to talk. We were talking and I was like drunkenly trying to say like reference Pavlov's dog, like, you know, um, <laughs> the dog that's been trained to like salivate yeah, yeah. um with like a bell yeah word. so he like Cory, me and Corey, um our basically our relationship is just us trolling each other yeah. um, uh so he decided to troll me he's like you mean schrodinger's cat and i was like yeah and then five minutes later i was like hey <laughs> so i guess like after that he was just like i'm gonna i'm gonna write a character named cat <laughs> well, my character's name is actually Cat. You don't. We're not. We kind of cut out the scene where you hear that her name's Cat. Um, but my character's name is Catherine. Um, and he just decided to write based off of that. You know, Schrodinger's cat is kind of asking, questioning what like what is real and what's not. So like that's kind of the dilemma of Cat's character in this story is like what is real and what's not. Like why can't they go outside? Like like is somebody actually really sick? Da da. Um, so that's kind of the origin story, but yeah, Ian has a cuter one. Uh, I mean, well, because of this, this idea had definitely been brewing in Corey's head for a while. He was observing, you know, the the, dy- the dynamic between Vivian and I and how we kind of act like siblings uh, within our friendship. And so I think he was really inspired by that. And I remember at my uh, 18th birthday last year, um, Jess and Corey and Vivian and me and some friends all went out to get a hot pot together 
And Yum. at dinner, he mentioned, you know, a script idea that he had been mulling over. And so he kind of pitched daughter to me. And I was like, I am so down to do, you know, a surreal art house film with Vivian and with you guys. Like, I, I just, you know, I didn't even realize that we could make a movie. Like, I think it was just one of those things. I was like, oh, yeah, sure, <laughs> sure, sure. Like a, a script. OK, yeah, yeah, we'll make a movie. And then. They, they put in the hard work and dedication to actually make that shit happen. Um, to, uh, uh, another little extra like de- de- detail that Ian forgot. Um, I think, didn't Corey specifically pitch it to you? He was like, how do you feel about playing a really creepy kid? Yeah, <laughs> I forgot about that part. Yeah, I and was like, Ian was I just was like, like, I really want to explore rage at some point. And Corey is like, great, done. <laughs> Yeah, he asked he asked us like, you know, me and Vivian one day he asked us like what we would like to explore as, you know, actors and just like within our within our careers, we don't really get the opportunity to play like the characters that really dive deep into, you know, our personal needs and wants like we kind of I know, at least in my experience, I've had, you know, like a supporting role where I don't really have like as much character development. And I know Vivian kind of has that similar experience of like, having like more of like a love interest or like a side supporting character and so it was my first opportunity where someone asked me that question of like what do you want to do with a character like I was like oh I guess maybe just like showing some really like unbridled pure rage or doing some like creepy creepy shit (laughs) (laughs) and he created that for me which is just so awesome I'm so grateful for that opportunity to like have that inspiration um to the writing and like directly Mm -hmm. influence it in that way Mm, yeah well thank you so much i'm so looking forward to see daughter and see you guys both on it and just the amazing acting that's gonna happen and this really really interesting foreshadowing of covid (laughs) yeah that happened and before i go how can people get in touch with you both so um i'm on all social media under the same handle it's um ian alexander except the l is an i because ian alexander was already taken (laughs) uh years ago when i when i rebranded as ian alexander um so yeah it's ian Alexander, <laughs> which is I know it's weird, but um, that is my social media. My favorite is sorry before I say my social media. My favorite is um, the guy with the handle Ian Alexander on Twitter. His Twitter, yeah. I'm not, I'm not Ian, uh, I'm not Ian Alexander, the trans actor. <laughs> yeah, literally for years, years and years, people have been tagging him instead of me, and I, I, I should just reach out to him and be like should we just should we just give it up like should i should i just take the handle my guy no hard feelings but (laughs) i mean you could you could reach out and ask him to if you could buy it off him i honestly could yeah i totally could he probably has been waiting for me to like offer him some financial compensation (laughs) for like the years of torment of being tagged by my followers (laughs) so um sorry yeah, my I'm on Instagram, same handle, V I V I E N T N G O. And before we wrap up, do you have any last words of wisdom, advice for our listeners of this podcast? Stay Asian, stay gay. Don't let <laughs> your racist homophobes tell you otherwise, especially during COVID. I don't know. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. And on on that note, I guess my words of wisdom are, um, you know, remember, we're all in this together. And I know self-isolation and quarantine is really, really hard, but we've got each other and you can reach out to people. Don't be afraid to, you know, send a friend a text, you know, or or shoot me a DM. I'm I'm on social media a lot now. So. If you're feeling alone, you know, just like tweet at me. We can have a conversation. Um, you don't have to be alone because because we're all in this together. So thank you so much for our conversation. Really appreciate it. And for those of you listening, 
If you have a few minutes, we'd we'll love a rating and review um, in Apple iTunes, sorry, Apple Podcast. And if you have a minute, leave us a comment. We love comments. And if you want to get in touch with me, you can find me on Instagram, on social media at Stephen Wakabayashi. And thank you so much for listening and hope your day can be much more mindful. <laughs> Bye now. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>